broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. And thanks to yourself and Charity Village for partnering with me on this really crucial topic today. It's um, it's one that is obviously creating a lot of um, excitement and a lot of uh, worry in the nonprofit sector. So, Marina, can you tell me how many people registered for this webinar? Yes, Leanne, we've actually hit a record for Charity Village. So we have like almost 4,600 people registered for this session today. That's incredible. Yeah, that, really that is, is massive. Yeah. So, um, so part of the reason for saying that to everybody today is, you know, it's not about me. I'm, I'm not quite that popular yet. Um, it is about the topic. And it's, I just, I wanted to share that in, and for Marina to share that because often in self care, we, we kind of feel alone and we feel like we might be the only ones not getting it right. And it's not true. As you can see, this is a hot topic, um, both uh, for us as individuals in the sector, but also for organizations. So we're going to look at both of those today, but we're going to focus a little bit more on individuals to start. Um, and my goal for this session is um, you're probably not going to learn loads of new stuff. There might be some reframing or some a couple of new ideas you go away with, and that's awesome. Um, but honestly, it's it's a reminder for us to commit to ourselves. So that's what we're going to focus a lot of our attention on. How do we do that? Okay, so who am I? Who's this woman talking to you about self-care? Well, I'm basically a lifelong helper type. I started volunteering at the age of eight and I've spent um, all of my career pretty much in the nonprofit sector. I was a frontline practitioner for many years and I've been an executive director for almost 15 years. I've worked in and led organizations in a range of different areas of particularly human service. That's been my area. So I've worked in homelessness, mental health, youth engagement, volunteering, employment, community information, name it. I've, I've touched it probably. So nowadays, though, I specialize in helping leaders to be more inspiring because I think that's crucial for the survivor of the sector, both for retaining staff and gaining support from stakeholders. And to be inspiring, we have to feel good about ourselves and our work. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey. And my journey to get to the place where I look after myself um, and have it as a priority has been a long one. And it's not a perfect one <laughs> yet. And it will probably never be a perfect one, so just to say that. But I'm hoping by doing this webinar today, it won't be as long for you. So I got my first real experience of burnout. About I was a street worker in Dublin, Ireland. Oh, wait, not that kind of street work. I know what you're thinking. Stop. Um, no, my job involved going out between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. on the streets of Dublin to engage and support homeless young people. Now, at that time, Ireland found it difficult to accept that youth homelessness was an issue. And on any given night in Dublin, there were a maximum of 12 beds available in the whole city for kids who were out on the street. Adding to that, young people had to go to police stations where social workers would choose the most vulnerable kids, which usually meant the youngest. And young people could stay for up to three nights. So what that meant, these were only emergency bed places, that meant there were only maybe five or six available beds on most nights. So there was literally nowhere for the other young people to go. At the same time in Dublin, there was a major heroin problem. So young people who could not find accommodation would often eventually end up using or dealing or both. And in order to use, the young people had to earn money and they weren't working nine to five gigs. So it was the saddest situation I've ever worked in. And, you know, previously I'd worked in a night shelter in the center of London, England. I mean, it, that was hard stuff, but this was heartbreaking. I was working with 12 to... 19 year olds who had nowhere to go during the night and they were continually stuck in a cycle of addiction and vulnerability i i tell you i went to probably i think it was at least eight funerals that year of young people or the, in the two years i worked there i was sad and angry all the time um and angry at the system you know like this isn't right but i had nowhere to put that and so um what happened was I, I started not looking after myself well. I stopped caring about my appearance. I didn't take breaks. Sometimes I didn't even take holidays because I felt like it was my duty to be there for those kids. 
It was only when my back went and it really went. I ended up in an ambulance having to go to hospital. Um, I'll tell you Irish nurses at the time weren't that sympathetic. <laughs> but anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but I had to take six months off work to heal. It was that bad. And so I rested, I exercised, I ate better. Um, I took up painting and started studying again. I just focused on myself and healing. Eventually, I was ready to work again, but I couldn't face working or even living in Ireland at that stage. Every time I went out, the kids, the young people that I used to work with, they were out on the street, they were asking for cigarettes or asking for money. It was really heartbreaking. So we ended up moving back to England and uh, take, I took another job and I kept on in the nonprofit sector, but um, it, it, that was the toughest job I've ever had. And what I didn't realize at the time that I'd gone past burnout and into depression. And so that took a lot longer to heal than my back. Basically what happened was I essentially sacrificed myself for the cause and I had to find my own way back to me. Now your story of where you are at right now may not be as extreme or it might be because you know, there's a, a lot of you here, a lot of you working in different ways in different sectors. Um, but if, even if it's not as extreme as that, I wanted to share it as an example of where we can end up when we don't invest in our own self-care. The bottom line is we cannot be of service to anyone else if we're not well ourselves. So what does self-care actually mean? It's actually really, really simple. <laughs> it means to care for oneself. And as you can see, this dictionary definition is super simple. But doing it when we work in the nonprofit sector is often not so easy. So why is self-care important? Again, it might seem obvious that we need to look after ourselves, but we don't necessarily do it. And it's important in all walks of life. I know lots of people in different sectors who are stressed out and, you know, it's it's. We're, we're, we've got fast times now, but it's even more important in our sector. And, and the reason why is because our work requires that we care. Whatever kind of nonprofit you're working in, you need to care about the cause and about the people that you serve. And anyone who's worked with someone who's burned out or is super stressed all the time knows, and you know, you've got, you've probably worked with someone that, that this has happened to. The first thing that goes is compassion. So we care less about what we're trying to do. We care less about the people we work with. We care less about the organization. And ultimately, we care less about who we're trying to help. And when employees no longer care, that can have a negative impact that spreads in the organization. So self-care is crucial for individuals, but it's also crucial for organizations to ensure that they meet their missions. I'm going to name something here as well that has spread like a virus, as I say, in every sector, but I find it a particular worry to me in our, in our, our sector, the nonprofit world, and I call it the badge of busy. So busy is a word that's used for every interaction now. So how are you? Busy. What's new? I'm so busy. How's work? Busy. How are the kids? Busy. Hasn't it gotten boring to talk to people? Because when they say it, you have to say it too. I'm, how are you? I'm so busy. Oh yeah, me too. And that's the end of the conversation, right? Because you're, where do you go from there? And so what we need to do is to set that busy badge down and we need to stop celebrating. Um, and again, I use a small C there because it's, it's not a celebration, but we seem to celebrate just how busy we are and talk about it all the time. So let's set it down and leave it behind. Okay, so historically, we have framed self-care as kind of wellness programs or individual activities that help us to relax. And those are important for sure. Massages are great. Yoga is awesome. I love taking naps. I'm gonna mention them quite a few times probably in this webinar. Um, but let me give you some corporate speak, which is really useful. Um, you could make the case to your boss if you want. You can say, you know, it's time for my horizontal life pause. Seriously, they won't know what it is. And you'll, they might even say yes. So uh, there you go. There's some corporate speak for you if, if naps feels too childlike. But anyway, these are practices that can and easily get disrupted by our to-do list of air quote, more important things, right? So your massage doesn't seem that important when you've got a client in front of you 
who's telling you if they have nowhere to sleep that night or there's a major funding report due all of a sudden that goes off the list so what we need to do to support our investment in these practices so that it's not always that kind of superficial decision that we're actually working towards something bigger we need to develop a self-care mindset so here's a list of things that um, the mindset my self-care mindset involves and i'm going to go through each one of them so you can get a better sense of what i'm saying with each so the first one is knowing who you are fundamentally the self-care mindset starts there you need to be able to figure out what's happening for you emotionally and determine what you need both in the moment and over the long term self-care has kind of been sitting out over here on a, as an, a thing to do for quite some time and we need to bring it back into what i call the circle of self so these three things self-awareness self-reflection and self-care need to work together in order for us to be truly able to look after ourselves so we're going to start with self-awareness this as i said before it's the ability to understand ourselves as we mature, we gain an understanding of our own personalities, our feelings, how we relate to others. But this is also about knowing what gives you energy, what takes away energy, what triggers you emotionally. Sometimes it's about knowing what values you hold and what you do when they feel compromised. Because that's, that's a very, you know, the activity of what we do in work is, is stressful. But so are sometimes the conditions in which we're working and the places that we work in. Self-awareness helps us to be more in tune with our own needs and know how to meet them. So I'm going to give you an example. For many years, I thought I was an extrovert. I've always been comfortable talking in front of a crowd. I can make small talk like nobody's business. Frontline practitioner here. I was the one out doing outreach on a number of jobs. So I can talk to anybody and bring out the small talk. But I don't and I never have enjoyed parties. And I would get exhausted after big events. And often I beat myself up about it when I canceled social engagements because I wanted to stay in by myself. So, you know, long day at work and I arranged to go out with some friends and then I go, ah, oh, I can't make it. But when I learned about introversion and about, you know, extroversion, introversion, and it, this is just an example, but for me, it was like a big light switching on because I didn't realize that when you're an extrovert or an introvert, that it's about where your energy comes from. It's not about how you behave necessarily. It's about how you get your energy. And when I understood that, I understood myself so much better and realized that I wasn't an extrovert. I was actually an introvert with some extrovert abilities. Um, and so that helped me to understand who I was. And now I can make decisions about what I need more effectively. So for example, I like one-to-one -one interactions more than I like group interactions, unless I'm leading it. Um, but I think that might be a control issue and that might be a whole other webinar. <laughs> so, um, but I know that time to myself and rest after a big group interaction are crucial for me. So I don't plan, plan too much after I've got a, done a training session, for example. Knowing who I am and what I need enables me to look after me and be mostly guilt-free about it. I still feel bad when I cancel things, so sorry to all my mates. But um, ultimately, those moments, I know that I'm doing it because I need it. So we're going to move on to self-reflection. Self-reflection involves the practice of checking in with ourselves. So how am I feeling? What is this reaction I'm having to what that person said? What's going on for me right now? Self-reflection helps us to better understand what's happening for us emotionally and gives us a little planning time to deal with things better. So setting aside time each day for a little bit of self-reflection, and it, you could go for a walk, you could sit in the park at lunchtime, close your office door, close your eyes for a bit, maybe after a tough conversation. It's really important to turn everything off and everyone off for a little while and just listen to you. We've actually gotten out of the habit of this in a very big way, if we were ever in the habit of this, but I like to think that we were. But, um, you know, currently the challenge that we have around self-reflection is we have so many things. We have an uh, inundated uh, e email box. We've got a phone that's constantly beeping. We, we are constantly checking to see what somebody has to say to us. It's just life has changed. And so often we don't take the time for self-reflection and that's really super important because 
how do you know what you need? How do you know how to take care of yourself if you haven't had a little visit with yourself, right? If you haven't had any time. It's also really important too, not just in terms of kind of, um, you know, bad situations or, or it's about ongoing pieces, but it's also about getting good insights into what you want from life. So on the weekends, I'll often set aside, you know, 15, 20 minutes just to dream. And it's literally just close my eyes and what do I want from my life? Um, and it may seem like a luxury, but if it does, that means you need to do it more <laughs> because you visiting who you are and what you want is going to help you better understand how you can look after yourself. And that's both in tricky situations, but also life in general. Okay, so self-reflections is also about checking in with ourselves about the bigger picture stuff. So life isn't this smooth sailing thing, right? Like things happen in our lives that impact us. It's not just about work. So even though we're talking about the nonprofit sector, we, we, life happens outside. So we have a, a often challenging work in the sector, but we also have um, life events that impact us. And ongoing stress and challenging life or work events, they, they, those things in the background might make us more likely to react in a deeper way than we might have before. Right. So if we're living with a, a low level of anger and something happens at work, if we're not aware that we're living with a low level of anger. Maybe we're having trouble with our partner. Maybe, you know, our our child's teacher is terrible and causing us to stress all the time. Who knows? But um, something happens at work and then we snap and we're, we overreact. So self-reflection on an ongoing basis to check in with yourself is, is super important. But to, what helps me is thinking about this as my iceberg. So if you think about having an iceberg, so if you look at the picture, the top part is what everybody sees and the bottom part is what you're dragging along behind you that nobody sees. So when you overreact, they can't see the iceberg. They don't know what's there. And so then you're kind of in an even more challenging situation because it's hard for you to be able to explain why you know, you might not even know. That's why self-reflection is really super important so that you know what's going on for you. So again, I'm going to give you an example from my um, life. So part of this is I want to share some of my self-care failure stories <laughs> for you to learn from. Um, I have learned from them also and I've overcome them. So don't worry, I'm not going to cry here. Um, but I think it's really important for us to, I, I, I'm a storyteller, so I want to share some stories. Anyway, a number of years ago, I took a job in a new city and um, I moved there with my four-year-old son and we I'd split up with his dad. And so I was not only going through a breakup, but I moved to a new place where I had no support network and I had a little kid that was totally freaked out by the change in circumstances. And I didn't do anywhere near enough self-reflection during this time. And as a result, the job did not go well. Now, it could be argued in times of crisis, survival is more important. And yeah, made it through, you know what, in a way, whatever, right? These things happen. But when you're in it, uh, it's super, it's super horrible. And also leaves you feeling like you're, you know, a feeling of failure when, when things don't go well. But what was happening was I was failing to make the connection between what I was feeling personally and how I was performing at and what I was feeling about my job. So I was angry a lot of the time. I was wandering around with a fairly big iceberg of anger and, you know, stress. And then I couldn't communicate effectively with some key people. You know, I had a board of directors and I had a lot. I didn't have a lot of patience. Let's just say that way. Um, and, and you know, and I was just angry and, and it, it didn't I didn't put myself over well and I wasn't necessarily making the best decisions. Um, I still did a good job in a lot of ways, but it didn't work out in the end uh, because I had not built up the relationships that I needed to. And I put that down to, you know, my iceberg. I was dragging it around. It was huge iceberg at the time. And uh, so now I, you know, I forgive myself for that. But I also make a point of checking in regularly on my iceberg. And again, it might sound a bit silly. But sometimes we just need a little analogy and hopefully this will help you. It's like, okay, what is my iceberg looking like these days? And you can chip away at making it smaller when you do check in and see what's happening for you regularly. So what you're not doing is building up a reactive kind of um, 
anger, stress, whatever, that's going to erupt inappropriately in times when you don't need it to. And that's part of self-care too, because representing ourselves how we want to be seen in the world is looking after ourselves. But also, um, it's not necessary often for that to happen. And if it does, so be it, right? Move on, say, say you're sorry, move on, whatever. But for you, in, on a general basis, and for us as humans, if we know what's going on for us, we can handle ourselves better. Okay, so the next mindset piece is to focus on your big picture. When we are stressed on an ongoing basis, every little thing can have an impact on how we feel about ourselves, um, about others, about our work. You know, it's easy, right? We get set off easy. So it's really important for us to carry with us, and this is a mindset shift, because um, if we can shift from day-to-day -day drama to big picture, it can help us through those times of drama or times of challenge because otherwise the little things start adding up so for example if your mission in life is to help seniors feel less lonely and that's what you're working in and you're like yeah that's that's my passion and that's what I want to do you can focus on that when you're getting irritated by the little stuff around you either at home or at work right like you can just check in and kind of go okay this is irritating but I'm still on track to help seniors feel less lonely. So making choices about who and what you'll do in your life that relates to a mission or to your mission is really super important. And a good question you can ask is, does this moment make a difference to my mission? If it doesn't, you can leave it behind. If it does, it's something to work through or, or work on or, or whatever, it's important. But if it's not, then mentally you can leave it behind. And by the way, just because we're nonprofit types doesn't mean we abandon big pictures for ourselves. We may not have a big passion or a big mission. That's a big misnomer that somehow we all wake up and have a passion for something and we spend our life doing it. Sometimes that that is the case. Uh, sometimes we're taking on a job because it sounded good and yeah, I like helping kids do this or I like working with seniors. And that's that's cool. That's okay. But it is really important for us all to have a big picture of our own life. Um, because that is also what will carry us through challenging job situations or um, uh, little things that happen at work. It'll help us build our relationships. So make sure you have a personal big picture for your life. And I'm going to go into artsy fartsy world right now. And I'm going to tell you that creating a vision board has been really helpful to me. And uh, normally I'm not crafty at all I don't uh, do this kind of stuff but I went to some leadership training a, a few years ago at the Banff Leadership Center by the way if you ever they do scholarships so have a look at their site and sometimes you get training it's really amazing but one of the things we did was created a vision board and I found it really helpful to help me check in and see if I'm on track or if I'm getting distracted by things that don't matter. It's really easy to make. You get some pictures that tell the story of the things you want in life. You put them on a piece of paper and you put it on your wall. If you're super crafty, you can draw, use magazines, you can create a collage, that kind of thing. I'm not super crafty, so I just did it on, on the computer. Um, but it's been really helpful to me in times of stress or indecision. So, you know, have a think about what do you want from your life? overall and it's not about stuff just a little hint there it's not about stuff it's about how you want to feel it's about maybe what you want to accomplish or maybe what what you want from life in general so just a little tip if you if you uh, have a chance create yourself a vision board and keep it handy so you can check in on yourself it really helps um, move through the small stuff okay this is where some of you may click leave in the webinar I'm sorry. Please don't go. Hear me out. Hear me out. We need to check our martyr status in terms of our mindset and, and looking after ourselves. So how many times when people ask what you do, do they say, oh, aren't you wonderful for doing that? Isn't that marvelous? Oh, you must be so caring. Right? Like it happens all the time, you know, to a point where I, I stopped telling people because I, I got a little embarrassed. <laughs> it's just, like, oh my goodness. Um, but it feels nice, of course. It, of course it feels nice. And it's good to have that recognition. Add to that a continual slam at work all the time, helping others or fighting to protect the earth or whatever we're doing to make the place, make the world a better place. 
And it's really hard not to feel like a martyr, right? It, it's really hard not to feel like we are giving ourselves or sacrificing ourselves somehow. And I, I think that's particularly true on um, payday when we look at our bank accounts <laughs> and we see that all of that work and all of that effort and all of that emotional investment hasn't landed us a great big paycheck necessarily. So, you know, and and again, like that's real. So I'm, I'm not joking about that. But but there's a piece that says, oh, I do so much for so little. Right. And we complain about our and not everybody does, but I've heard it a lot. And I've, I've joined in sometimes I really work hard not to. But there's a piece around, you know, we don't get paid the big bucks to do really tough work. We don't necessarily get recognition. Nobody's nece nobody's really thanking us every single day necessarily, like, especially if you're working either in climate change where, you know, there are not a lot of little wins to be had. We have to have a big win there. Same with homelessness. We, we sometimes have clients who will say thank you, but often they won't because you know what, they're in desperate situations and they went and got some food and, and that's great, but to, they, they still don't have somewhere to sleep like there's a whole piece there about um you know we don't necessarily have ongoing appreciation for the stuff that we do and we do complain about it right we say stuff like nobody else would do this job for this amount of money nobody knows how hard it is if only they and i'm not sure who they are but we say this for so many things but if we continually approach our days feeling like we're making a sacrifice we generate a need for other people to appreciate us and then we get upset when people don't seem to be showing the appreciation that they we think they should be and we we make our very generous sacrifice and you know sometimes it's you know we're, we make less money sometimes we uh give more time sometimes we don't sleep well sometimes we give up our lunch break sometimes we don't go to our doc daughter's soccer game because we have a client we give up things all the time and when you do that builds and contributes to ongoing stress and can create burnout it also impacts relationships at home and at work and they can deteriorate so you know especially with you know and I found myself doing this sometimes you know going home and my my kid won't eat his dinner and and you know the classic kind of do you know how many kids don't get to have food tonight you know um, he's not the most receptive to that or, or <laughs> gracious about it and he says the same thing that I used to say which is well then give them my food but anyway but the but that's the piece right is that we are constantly aware that there are other folks who have less and that we need to do more to help them and I do think it's really important that we have to be careful not to jump into that martyr place where we are feeling like we are sacrificing. So that's why I say check your martyr status regularly because you're also getting stuff from the job, right? You're getting satisfaction. There are a lot of corporate folks sitting in cubicles who would desperately love to come and do the kind of work that we're doing. Now, they don't know the reality, re reality of it, but they think it's wonderful. We get to help people. We get we get to have an impact beyond making money. So there's a lot of stuff we do get from it. But if you start thinking of your work as a sacrifice, shift that mindset. Or if you're doing it regularly, you may want to think about another line of work or to move into, if you're frontline, to move into an administration role or something, because it does in fact everybody else you have to be really careful and, and we we see a lot of this happens with leaders sometimes who've been in a role for a very long time and you know their pay grade hasn't stayed the same as a lot of new leaders or or they've built up a a, a kind of a 20-year history of sacrificing themselves and it's a hard story to follow right it's it doesn't feel inspiring it's it, it's it's um not useful but you need to look after you and so if we think back to my story about my work in Dublin, it's a really good example of where being a martyr and sacrificing your own health doesn't help anyone anyway. The young people I worked with lost a really great worker. I was really good at that job and I cared about them. Okay, are you all still here? Yeah, you haven't left, thank you. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that resonated with you. It's a tough one and we don't talk about it much, but again, in terms of mindset, we don't need to sacrifice ourselves. 
Okay, and so part of that is about having compassion for ourselves. So often people working in the sector have a huge sense of compassion for others. We have, we care about animals, we care about the earth, um, but too often we give all that compassion away and don't keep any for us. And you are as important as the people or the cause you're helping. I'm gonna say that again. You are as important as the people or cause you're helping. Write it down and repeat it to yourself when it's needed. It's really important that you treat yourself the way you treat others. So when you think of yourself as just as important and as deserving as, of care as anyone else, that's the mi mindset that will foster better self-care. You are important too. And again, that will lead to you being able to help others. It's kind of a weird um, oxymoron. But the more compassion you have for yourself, the more care you have for yourself, the more kind of, of a full bucket you have to share with others. When we run empty, we can't help anybody else. Okay, again, this seems pretty obvious. Um, finding your joy is important. But when we're too busy and sacrificing ourselves for the cause, we lose track of what brings us joy. We might not even know anymore. Uh, similar to self-compassion, your joy is just, your joy is as important as that of others. So, you know, a lot of us uh, aim to create joy, create a better life for others to help them um, create a better life for themselves. Well, the same needs to be true for us. And the good news is joy doesn't have to be a big thing. It's finding the little things, the little moments and treasuring them. Again, um, you know this already. I'm sure, um, but I'm just trying to remind us because feeling joyful is one of the most important things we can do in our self-care because it elevates our our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our, uh, it elevates our mood all the time. And like I said, it doesn't have to be big things. For example, I love watching my dog um, run and play with other dogs. We walk in the woods um, in an off-leash thing and I listen to the birds, he runs around, and it's a moment of joy that I just hold on to. And to the extent that I do it now in the mornings, and I try and do it at night too. So again, I've gotten better in terms of trying to um, structure my day so I find those moments. So again, it's not a big thing, but you just need to take the time and make the commitment to look for it. I also suggest you need to do it at work. Um, what gives you joy about the work that you do? If your answer is nothing, like seriously nothing, you might say that jokingly, but if it's seriously nothing, it's time to go do something else. I know that's harsh, but we have 35 to 40 hours that we might be working, if not up to 50 sometimes. That's a long time to spend doing something where you find no joy whatsoever. It's a long time. So try and come up with a few things and write them down and try and do them more often. Uh, as a leader, here's a tip for leaders. As I all, I always ask people what they love to do, and I organize their workload around that. And guess what? They're highly productive and highly energetic. And so this is also partly why, as individuals, we need to know where our joy, what our joy looks like within our work, because then you can advocate for doing more of it. It's really super important. Okay, now we're going to talk about some self-care strategies. So as mentioned earlier, self-care strategies are the practice of looking after ourselves, whether that's eating better, going to yoga, having horizontal life pauses. Remember this term, seriously, it's so good. <laughs> it's about making a commitment to ourselves and bringing that commitment to life regularly. So having the mindset is super important and then having the strategies in place and, and knowing what it is you're going to do to look after yourself is also super important because when we feel energized and refreshed and replenished we do a much better job of helping others so i liken the self-care strategies to putting on your oxygen mask first on the airplane if you can't breathe comfortably you cannot help anyone else and that's a theme i know all the way through but remember this part is for you to be able to help be helpful and of service to others your comfort um needs to be there you need to be breathing and and caring for you um so i'm going to talk about a few different strategies but the fun is finding out what works for you and or you already know it 
and you know commit to it again there's never just one thing by the way having a multiple having multiple ways to look after yourself is important so the first one is take timeouts timeouts are not the same as breaks breaks are important um, and I would say that super important because we just don't take them anymore. Um, many years ago, I did smoke. Sorry, I'm coming out and saying that. Um, but what, what I would do is because I smoked, I would take breaks. So I would go out and have my break and it'd be 15 minutes. I'd chat to my colleagues and take time out. And then when I stopped smoking, I stopped taking breaks because I didn't feel the need anymore. So they are super important and please do take them. Even 15 minutes just to walk around makes a difference. But timeouts are self-imposed, I'm completely signing off and not thinking about work. And so timeout from work is, you know, again, you need to clear the brain, you need to clear your mind and do something else. So take a day off to read, take a week off, go for an adventure, or take a year off to learn photography. I know a number of people who've done these things. Some and some people actually take, you know, and, and it's uh, we have it for our teachers. After five years of service, they can take a paid sabbatical. Now they earn more than we do in the nonprofit sector, but you could think about an unpaid sabbatical, right? And again, luxurious if you have the money, all of that kind of stuff. I get it, but just throwing it out there that there are often options that we may not have thought about. And so taking a time out, like I say, whether it's a day, whether it's um, an hour even, um, but it's super important because when you do this, you go back to work refreshed. And so it does mean, and again, you already know this, it means not looking at your email, it means um, turning off talking to your colleagues, it means maybe not even going on social media. You're taking a time out just for you. And self-check-ins. Um, again, when we're super busy, running fast all day long, we don't do this often. Self-check-ins are super important when it comes to reflection and determining what you need. So how am I feeling? Am I enjoying my work? Do I need to take a break? They're also helpful for when we have emotional breakdowns or challenging situations. So check in and see what's happening for you because only then will you know what the best route is forward. So this allows you a little bit of time and a little bit of, okay, what will I do next? I've already mentioned naps and horizontal life pauses uh, several times. I probably can't um, say it too much. Um, can you tell us my favorite <laughs> self-care strategy? Um, but I wanted to bring up, we also need to sleep well at night and make sure you get enough rest. And I'm talking about rest of mind too. So switch off work at night and give your brain a break. There's a really good book by Arianna Huffington. Um, she is the, or was the CEO and a founder of HuffPost. And she's written actually a couple of books, one called Thrive and another one on sleep. And she's got a whole mission around helping people know that sleep is, is, a, is a massive thing for you to be able to um, really look after yourselves better and present more effectively in the workplace too. This one is a tough one for many of us, but asking help, asking for help is massive. It's big. We have to learn how to do this. We just have to get over our, our kind of egos about it, I think. Um, and I say this with many years of experience of not asking for help. Um, we think it makes us look weak. It actually makes us look stronger and it helps us do a better job. Uh, if you're feeling overwhelmed, chronically stressed, or you even have an inkling that you're feeling any of these, ask for help at work from your boss, from your colleagues. Um, sometimes you have access to benefits that have wellness services attached. It may also just be not, it may not be a massive thing. It may just be, you know, I'm having trouble with this situation with a client, or I'm having trouble with this situation with a colleague. Uh, just the very act of asking for help helps you identify that you need it. And that's sometimes the uh, most important part of being able to work through it. When we deny that it's happening or deny to ourselves that we need help, then we're not dealing with it and it's sitting with us. It's massive um, contribution to why we feel overwhelmed and why we feel stressed is, is we're kind of picking up, it's kind of feeding the iceberg, right? Rather than dealing with the iceberg. So you may need to reduce your workload or you may need to help from the colleague to work through a difficult issue with a client, for example. But don't do it alone. You know, you don't need to do this work alone, especially if you're struggling. And again, um, obvious, and we talked about finding your joy. But again, this is the thing that goes first. 
um, when we feel we have too many things to do. So, and I have actually talked to people and particularly leaders who I work with these days, but I also remember, and I, I was the same for a long time. And it, it was, there was a, a point where I, I was kind of worried about this, where when people say, what do you enjoy doing? And I didn't know anymore. When I was younger, I, I could give you a list, but because I worked so much and put so much time into, um, you know, my cause or, or the workplace I was in, I didn't know what I enjoyed anymore because uh, I'd work all day, go home tired, make some dinner, throw something on, whatever, and then sit in front of the TV or what, you know, and, and sure, I could say I enjoy that. And that, I'm not saying that's bad because, you know, a good night of Netflix is awesome. But sometimes we forget that there are other things that we love to do. So some, I, I started reading again. Oh, I love reading. I've always loved reading. But I, honest, I didn't read a book for probably a year because I just I forgot that I loved doing it and I didn't prioritize it. So again, it's really obvious. But when we're stressed or burning out, we stop doing things we enjoy and we can end up in a really bad spiral towards depression or other mental health issues. So do make sure you're identifying the things you like to do. And then this is a big one, which is being grateful. And again, this is kind of, you've probably seen a lot of people talk about this, but um, this one took me a little while to get into as well. I was a little suspicious of the idea that having gratitude can make us happier, but now I believe in it fully. It's partly about mindset, but it's also about a practice. So what I do is every night I go to bed and I write down five things before I go to sleep that I'm grateful for from the day. They're often small things, but I do at least five. You can do it in the morning, set yourself up for the day too. But the reason why it works for me is that I do my five things I'm grateful for. I'm not thinking about the five things I didn't get done and going to sleep that way. So I sleep a lot better. So give it a go for a couple of weeks. See if it works for you. So as you can see, the three elements feed into the circle of self. You need to know what your needs are. You need to practice self-reflection to know what you when you need something um, and then you need to know what it is that helps you feel better so that you can meet those needs and an ongoing basis self-compassion and knowing how to find your joy are really key to looking after yourself okay so i'm thinking some of you are going well that's all great but what about organization i you know my organization doesn't even give me time so here are some strategies for organizations as well Self-care is an individual responsibility, but organizations play a significant role in whether and how we're able to do it when we're at work. So, you know, if you say, okay, uh, doing yoga, I'm going to do yoga every day at lunch, and the culture of your organization is nobody leaves their desks um, because the boss doesn't leave their desk, and so everybody else stays at their desk, and you get up and take your yoga mat, everybody's looking at you. Now, good for you if you're brave enough to go through all that but not everybody is so it, it just really super important for us to understand that and for organizations and leaders to understand that we do have a responsibility we are employers and we have a responsibility for our employees physical and mental health um, so what we need to do is to foster a culture of self-care organizations <laughs> we care right like a nonprofit set up because they care about people but sadly sometimes we sacrifice our our employees for the cause or we create environments that make people feel like they can't take a break because there's just so much to do there's so many people to help and they have much worse situations than you do so just keep going eh um when i think about my organization in dublin and it was a long time ago but it really should have had more in place for support when it had people going out late at night working with kids in what was an impossible situation there were so many nights that i stayed out all night with vulnerable kids because they had nowhere to go i got i went off the clock and just hung with them not by myself there were two of us but you know the organization really needed to buck up in terms of understanding the stress and the strain of the kind of work we were doing and the reality is that a lot of the work that we're doing is systemic or it's long term. So, yes, we often have people in front of us who need things, but our organizations are not going to solve global warming or eradicate homelessness within the next year. Our missions are long haul. So our organizations really do need to focus on the big picture, 
and calm down that sense of urgency that's constant in our organizations right now. It's like we're frantic. And they need to focus on the big picture because this is a long game. And so if we all burn out all our people that care, we we use up all the people with skills and talent and they go and work somewhere else because they're too tired or too frustrated or too burnt out, what do we have left? So we don't, the other part of it is, as I said before, we don't pay the big bucks in our sector, um, but we can offer better conditions for our people. So in a lot of different countries, a much higher number of holidays are offered. It's recognized that people need to take time out and it's the law and nonprofits figure it out. So we can do the same here, thing here and get our people refreshed and re-energized. We can also stand down from our need to see bums on seats in the office all the time. We can have flexible schedules, um, opportunities for people to take breaks, um, take time off. We can also be, we need to be organizations that promote reflection rather than reaction. The sense of urgency and insecurity is keeping us in reacting mode all the time. And as organizations, but also as a sector, and then, you know, the big one is lead by example. Leaders, please stop saying how busy you are. Please stop telling your people you worked all weekend and haven't slept for 542 days. Please stop. Enough. If you're not taking breaks or holidays or you haven't made it to your daughter's soccer practice because of work, you're telling your staff that you expect them to do the same. Your people watch you for clues as to how they should behave at work. So, you know, as leaders, we need to model self-care. And here's a hint, we'll be better at the job too. You'll be much happier in your work. And so when organizations foster a culture of self-care and support employees and support employees by ensuring they're treated well and that they're not chronically overworked, they provide better services. And that's a win for the organization, a win for employees, a win for funders and donors, and most important, not most importantly, very importantly, because we're all important elements, as I said, it's a win for those being served. Happy employees mean happy customers or clients, and that's better for our clients and our communities. Okay, so your homework, um, you will have gotten or you will get a bit of homework from me. So I thought it'd be important to help you start putting what we talk about in action. There's nothing worse than going to training and, and not and leaving it there and not doing anything about it. So hopefully you've got one or two new good ideas that you can put into practice. But I've also um, given you an exercise called the self-care strategic plan. And this is what it looks like. And basically it's a really simple tool I created for my online leadership course. I, I do a course for new and aspiring leaders, but it's a useful exercise for everybody. Now, if you see, I've only put in a couple strategies for each because it's not meant to overwhelm you. The self-care strategic plan should not stress you out. This is a tool for you to write down some things and put it on your wall, put it in your phone, put it up in your office at home or in your living room or wherever, so that when you're feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling stressed, um, one of the most difficult things for us to do is to actually figure out what to do. So this is your plan in advance and it will help you to kind of have some strategies you can grab to right away. It's also just a really nice uh, piece to have this kind of reflection. So give the plan a go and see how you feel after a couple of, a couple of months. Okay. I've gone through a lot of stuff there, a lot of information I've thrown at you, um, but just wondering if there's any questions. Marina, I think you guys have been monitoring the chat. We have, and there have been lots of questions. Um, I wanna thank you again, Leanne, for sharing your stories because I think um, what's really important in a session like this is for folks who are struggling with this aspect to recognize that they are not alone. And we do have a lot of other folks on the call today that are also struggling with this. So um, appreciate your um, personal insight there, Leanne. Thank you. Um, let's get started with uh, something that you were touching on a little bit at the end with leadership. We've had a number of questions come in about when you're working for a leader who doesn't seem to prioritize self-care, do you have some tips on how you can still incorporate it in your work life and perhaps model um, you know, better self-care strategies for the rest of the team and even your leader? Great question. Always the one because uh, when your leader isn't doing it, then it is, it, like I said, it's hard to have the terrain. Um, a couple of things. One is find a self-care buddy. So if you have a colleague, so if you're a team leader or if you're a frontline worker, if you have somebody who's in a similar position to you or maybe even a group of you who kind of can say, you know what, we're burning out, we're stressed, we're going to look after ourselves. Have, you know, 
um, a self-care buddy or a self-care group that can just focus on it for themselves so that when, um, if the culture isn't there, you're kind of creating a new culture for yourself. Because ultimately, um, a leader, a leader may, leaders follow too. I, I, I always, we always think that they're the ones, uh, and they are often in charge and may have created a, a, some, a culture, but often we follow others. We follow good ideas. So if you can kind of put yourself out there and just start, and again, it may be just taking your break and saying, I'm going and saying it rather than no, not a question. I'm going for a 15 minute break. I'll see you in a bit. Um, so again, modeling it yourself because leadership with, it's a small L, right? It's everybody is a leader. Um, they don't all have to be a, a titled leader, but you can be a leader in terms of your own self and your, your colleagues. So a couple of things, one is to be, um, to affirm your own right to take breaks and have your lunch and to, to buck up against the culture if you need to, and then to get strength in groups. So have a self-care buddy who you both go out for a walk together. Honestly, other people will follow um, or get a group of you together who kind of commit to it. Uh, the danger is that turns into a kind of meh, 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 kind of uh, complaining session. So stay focused on this is about self-care and feeling better. It's not about complaining about what's going on because that often is what happens. So um, assert your needs and do it and just ignore the raised eyebrows um, and get strengthened in, in, uh, in a group. Wonderful. And um, we've had uh, quite a few questions come in on a couple of points that uh, we'd like you to repeat, Leanne. One is, I believe you were referring to the training opportunities at the Banff Leadership Centre in Banff, Alberta? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if they're, they do um, in Banff, they do leadership um, sponsorships for people in nonprofit. Uh, who work in nonprofits. So if you go to the Banff Leadership website, I don't have it in front of me, but if you go there, um, you can see the different leadership programs and they often provide, um, like I say, sponsorships. Well, I, I think a few years ago, there was one for youth, there was one for general. I don't know that it's changed, but they, um, all of their leadership programs, and again, small L, it's not about necessarily your title. It may also be about your, uh, you just want to learn more about how to lead, but all, a lot of the programs in Banff are reflective and help you develop some good practices for um, self-development, self-reflection, all of that kind of stuff. So highly recommend. Wonderful. I've put that link in the chat box there for anyone that's interested. And I have been there myself as well. And I have to say they have an absolutely beautiful facility. So if you ever get a they chance do. to head out there, <laughs> go for it's it. Amazing. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to repeat is that um, that handout that Leanne talked about, about the self-care strategic plan, uh, you will get a link to that, uh, a PDF download um, in the uh, email that you get tomorrow with all of the other materials. So you'll be able to download that and, and print it off uh, to use. Um, okay, Leanne, let's continue on. Tips for finding your joy. Yeah, good question. I think um, the, the piece around that is to be open to it and um, that it is a solo affair you may have joy doing things with others but to start really it's about you um, I was sometimes bad about um, oh what do you want to do oh what do you want to do and so I spent a lot of time not knowing what brought me joy so there's there's something about recognizing what does it feel like when you feel joy and often it's that kind of excite sense of excitement um, so when you're at work what excites you? Like what gets you jazzed up and you're like, oh, I have so much, like you could feel like you could move a mountain. And um, again, it's hard because if the culture in your organization is is not built on, um, you know, asking that question, doing what you love and, and, and what brings you joy in your work, then it can be challenging. But that's why we need to develop it in, individually. And so my tips are be open to it. Um, so again, that's where we often are not. We're like, this is work. This is just a job, whatever. Or the opposite, which is uh, I'm not allowed to feel joy because other people are starving and I, we, there are hungry children and there are people who don't have homes. So it's not okay for me to feel joy. So my second tip, one is to be open to it and two is to commit to it, that you are just as important. Your joy in your life is just as important. We only have one. So um, being committed to the fact that you're allowed joy despite the hard work you're allowed 
Um, third, I would, like I say, just watch out for those feelings. When does that, that feeling of excitement and can't wait, when does that occur? Write it down. What's going on at work that you feel excited about? And like I said, if you don't feel excited about anything, then you need to move on because life is way too short. And there are plenty of nonprofits that have um, uh, cultures that, that kind of um, bring in that aspect. Um, and then also at home. So again, it's not all about work. It's kind of, again, paying attention to what, what you love doing, what, what feels good. Ultimately, the question is what feels good, right? So that's the piece that you need to look out for. Again, if, if things don't feel good a lot of the time, then you might not be well. So that's what happened. This happened to me a couple of times where uh, I found it hard to experience joy because I was depressed or I was too stressed or um, so if you can't find anything, get some help. Talk to somebody. Thank you. That's such a, a great, uh, a great point as well. Um, Okay, so on that topic also, um, you spoke a little bit about structuring your work around what you love to do. Can you talk a little bit more about what that might look like on a daily basis? Yeah, and again, it's a tough one because a lot of people don't have necessarily the choice about um, what their work looks like. But if you don't know what you enjoy doing and what you love doing, then you can't ask for it either. So on one side, like I say, as a leader, I ask people what they love and you know job descriptions are important but you know you can move things around and when you I've seen people do jobs where I look and go wow you you do this like two-thirds of the time but you do this a third of the time and you love it I'm going to move you over here so you know from a leadership perspective the more people love what they're doing the better quality work they provide um, what I would say is you as an employee, you don't have to love everything that you do. There's stuff I have to do I don't like. I don't love the admin side, all of that. But because I love most of what I do, it's okay. So for employees, it's kind of like figuring out what is it, again, what is it that, that I love doing? What am I really good at? What am I getting from here? And um, either talking to your supervisor or your ED or whoever it is and say, you know what? I really love doing this stuff. Can I do more of it? But you have to find it first. Can I do more? And, you know, I'm just going to say it straight out. And if, if you can't find it there, go find a new job that has those things. Um, because, again, doing what you love, that is the biggest form of self-care and work. And we are running up on time, but we're going to just uh, keep going for a couple more questions just so that we can fit in as many as we can here. So if you have to run, uh, we are recording and you'll get that recording tomorrow and it will include the full Q&A. Um, Leanne, how can we start reframing um, the martyr status? <laughs> uh, by uh, I think I'm just going to put up my uh, thank you because I see some folks are leaving so I want to say thank you to you all for coming um, and if you need to connect with me uh, here's the information not need to if you want to happy to hear from you um, reframing the martyr status is I think it is ultimately recognizing and I, I used to talk about this in volunteering a lot and used to get in a lot of trouble um, where you know in volunteering this was many years ago I I was in a particular volunteering situation where a lot of the people that volunteered would turn up and they'd be like, oh, we're just, we're so amazing for sacrificing our time and we're here. And, and I would say, you know, you get as much out of this as you're giving. And um, yeah, I got in trouble for saying that, but it's true. And it's the same with this kind of work. We're getting as much as we're giving. And if we're not getting as much as we're giving, then we need to balance that out. And that's when the martyr status kind of you know, comes in because we're kind of like, no, oh, now I'm sacrificing. Well, you shouldn't be sacrificing anything. And actually, this work is not about giving ourselves for others. It We can find um, at the end of the day when you go home and somebody has got a bed or somebody, um, a kid has been fed or uh, the world is a little greener or, you know, you had a great concert in your arts program you know, you feel good about that. And so rather than looking for the, the place where we feel like we're giving up something, we need to think about what we're getting. And we get a lot. Like I said, a lot of times it's not the big bucks, but that's, you know, money is money. Um, but we do get a lot if we're looking for it. That's very important to remember. Um, now, this is <laughs> something that I think all of us are aware of, but we didn't touch on it too much today. Um, so maybe as a bit of a reminder, can we talk a little bit about 
our cell phones, our smartphones, our tablets, um, our social media, and uh, you know what your suggestions are in terms of how that relates to self-care as well and, and the need to take some timeouts. Yeah, that would relate to the timeout. And you're right, we didn't talk about it loads and partly because I could go on and on and on about it for hours. <laughs> um, turn off, you know, and I, it's easier said than done, I know, but ultimately turn off. I. I find myself, um, and especially when we work in social justice or um, like at the, at the moment, I, it's really super hard to be on Facebook for me. And um, it's not even, you know, a lot of the stuff that's going on down south and it's not even my own country, a lot of the, the stuff that's happening, but I find myself and I can feel it getting more and more wound up, more and more upset. And, you know, it's only because I looked at my screen for a few minutes and found out stuff that I, you know, it was hard and I have to deal with it. So previously, you know, you had to receive a letter or you had to get a phone call or you had to watch the news at six o'clock to see stuff. I, it was contained. Whereas now it's just there all the time. And that's why the timeout is so important. It's about turning off and kind of recognizing. So in terms of self-care, one of the things that we do, uh, I think with social media is that we feel like we have to be available all the time for everything and everybody. You don't. You just don't. And, and I think with time, we're figuring it that out a bit better and we're moving on. So like in France, there's a law. People cannot be expected to email back after after hours. I mean, we're starting to figure that out. But on an individual basis, I think we just have to commit to the idea that screens are not making us happy all the time and that um, we're not going to find our joy there. I love going on Facebook and seeing what my friends have been up to. But when I spend too much time there, I, I lose my own time. I don't have my time to read a book or, or do something else. So I think it's a, it is a matter of self-discipline. But I also think that it's hard because we do have an expectation. You know, if I text somebody, I still kind of have an expectation. They're going to text me back right away. And I need to set that down too. So we need to also be kinder to others and kind of say, yeah, no problem. You're busy doing things you like. That's cool. So I think both set it down and uh, help others to do that too. Awesome. And our last question for today, relating to the iceberg. So when you notice that you're carrying around your iceberg, maybe you finally kind of get that self-awareness. Um, what are some tips to get beyond that? Right. So I think just noticing it is one of the big things, right? And it's, and I would say, and this sounds a bit silly, but it's kind of like, how heavy is it? How big is it? And so if your iceberg is just little and you're like, oh, just these few things, you can live with that. You've got a great big iceberg behind you. You've got some stuff to work on. And so it's about thinking about, um, again, getting help if you need it in terms of uh, maybe it's therapy, maybe it's um, talking to others, but mostly it's about just recognizing what's there because the iceberg grows without us seeing it, right? So, um, you know, and just back to my example. So, of course, I was stressed. Of course, I was upset. I had to split up with my partner. I'd moved cities. I'd changed jobs. I, I mean, how much do you want to do to yourself <laughs> at one time? So uh, a little tip, uh, maybe you don't want to do all those things at once. So prevention is uh, doing things in a more sensible order, like I did not do. Um, but life happens. So I think it's also the prevention piece. A lot of the stuff around this self-care will help prevent building the, the iceberg, which is literally the self-reflection part is massive because it just, if we, if we, we kind of nip it before it grows and we deal with it. So it might be... Um, a little, and, and I'm talking about the little stuff there, um, but if you've had a grief situation or you've had something really terrible or you have, you know, you've had an accident or things like that, your iceberg's going to be big and it's kind of accepting that and thinking about, well, how am I going to chip away at it? How am I going to help myself feel better? So continue looking for ways to identify what's happening for yourself and ways that to help you feel better will chip away at it. That's great. And I think certainly the what you touched on before about uh, never being afraid to ask for help. And in some cases, maybe asking for professional help as well is, is you know, exactly. a good thing to do. So great. Well, thank you so much, Leanne. Um, this was such an important topic, and I'm glad that we had you here presenting on this today. We had uh, so many people join in, so it's it's clearly something we need to be talking more about in the sector. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And Thanks, everybody, for tuning in and, and having the conversation. It was, it was really fun. 
And before we sign off today, I just want to remind you all, we are going to follow up by email tomorrow with the webinar recording. If you uh, would like to, of course, you can share that with anyone that, that you like. We do make those publicly available, so feel free to forward that to any of your colleagues that you think might benefit from the uh, presentation as well. There's also going to be a short survey uh, that will take you less than five minutes to fill out, so please do complete that for us if you can. Uh, you'll have an opportunity there also to let us know if there's other topics you'd like to see covered in a future session. And we're going to be continuing our free Day in the Life series of webinars on May 31st. We're going to welcome back presenter Eileen Chadnick for a presentation on how to improve your assertiveness at work, which certainly plays into uh, the self-care piece as well. Uh, we're going to send registration information for that session in tomorrow's email as well in case you are interested. So thank you again everyone for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.